perform anesthesias, anesthesia for post anesthesia care nurses. This is a seven video series on the basics of pharmacology and anesthesia techniques for the peri anesthesia care nurse. We, a group of five outstanding senior students from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine Nurse Anesthesia Program and one CRNA, have created this series in the hope it will help the transition into the peri anesthesia world. The series attempts to shine a bit of light on the techniques anesthesia uses during surgery, as well as explain the basics of the pharmacology behind our drug uses. This is by no means a series that will explain everything that happens during anesthesia, but our hope is that you, the peri anesthesia nurse, will find our report a little less intimidating and a little more informative. After all, the better you understand the report, the better you can take care of the patient. And ultimately, this will increase the safety and satisfaction for both your patient and yourself. The group consists of Alexandra Horman, BSN RN, CCRN, Braden Seidler, BSN RN, Jordan Coleman, BSN RN, CCRN, Kelsey Squires, BSN RN, CCRN, Victoria Koch, BSN RN, and Michael Storm, DNAP, CRNA, CCRN. The videos can be watched separately, but there are some references among the videos and the basics of the pharmacology along the way. Therefore, it may be beneficial to watch the series in order. Either way, have fun and don't forget to download the accompanying handouts. These handouts are the complete transcripts of the narrations and include all relevant pictures from the videos. This video series is sponsored by Storm Anesthesia and Palmetto Health Richland Anesthesia Department. Enjoy and let's get started. Hello, I'm Alexandra Harmon and I'm a senior student of the Nurse Anesthesia Program at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. This lecture is part of a series of lectures for nurses in the Post Anesthesia Care Unit and is specifically directed to teach intravenous opioid anesthetics. Opioids are the drug of choice for moderate to severe pain. Almost every patient will receive or has received some form of opioid at some stage in their surgical stay. Thus, it is vital for the PACU nurse to understand how these drugs work in order to assure safe monitoring of the patient and administration of the drugs. With this in mind, objectives for this course will be to discuss the clinical use of opioid analgesics, explain how opioids provide pain relief, we'll describe the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of opioids and distinguish commonly used opioids with a focus on key differences. We will strive to understand signs and symptoms of opioid overdose and plan for appropriate intervention. We are first going to go over some basic keywords and definitions that will make understanding this lecture a little easier. The term opium refers to the exudate found from poppy flowers. Note some of opium's original uses, euphoria, analgesia, sedation, relief from diarrhea, and cough suppression. An opiate is a drug that has been extracted from the exudate of the poppy. Morphine, isolated in the early 1800s, is the prototype opiate. Unlike an opiate, an opioid can be a natural or synthetic drug that binds to opioid receptors in the body to produce an agonist effect. An example of a natural opioid is morphine, whereas fentanyl is synthetic. This is the most inclusive of our terms. Endorphins are endogenous opioid peptides. This means they are produced naturally by the body. There are two places natural opioids occur. One is in the juice of the opium plant from which morphine and codeine are derived. The second is in endogenous peptides which are naturally occurring endorphins. All other opioids are either semi-synthetic or synthetic. Semi-synthetic means that they are prepared from morphine. An example here would be heroin, which was actually originally manufactured for and used in hospital settings. Synthetic means man-made compounds produced to act in a similar manner as the original drug. Meperidine and fentanyl are two examples of synthetic drugs. Now, how do opioids work? 
Opioids achieve their analgesic effects by first binding to a specific opioid receptor. It is generally accepted that there are three opioid receptor subtypes, mu, delta, and kappa. These subtypes can be further broken down into mu1 and mu2, delta1 and delta2, and kappa1 and kappa3. Mu1 receptors are responsible for the bradycardia seen with opioids and the euphoric feeling reported by patients. Mu2 receptors are responsible for physical dependence and respiratory depression. Spinal analgesia, although mediated by all opioid receptors, is primarily produced via Mu2, whereas supraspinal analgesia is mediated by all opioid receptors except Mu2. Although subdivided into delta-1 and delta-2, receptor stimulatory effects are not specific to one versus the other. Kappa-1 receptors provide spinal analgesia, whereas kappa-3 is primarily supraspinal. Kappa receptor stimulation causes dysphoria, like hallucinations, and is responsible for sedation. Opioids can be given in a variety of ways, orally, nasally, intramuscular, transdermal, intrathecal, epidural, and intravenously. When administered orally, opioids are only modestly absorbed and undergo a significant first pass effect in the liver. This means that when the drugs are absorbed in the stomach, they pass through the liver before being delivered to their receptors. The liver can break down the drugs into inactive forms before the drugs even have a chance to enter the systemic circulation. Exceptions to this rule are oral coating and oxycodone, which have reduced first pass effect. This gives these drugs a greater oral efficacy. Efficacy refers to both the maximum response achievable from a dose and to the capacity for therapeutic effect or beneficial change of a given therapeutic intervention in clinical settings. Anesthesia providers most commonly choose the routes of intrathecal, epidural, and intravenous for administration of opioids, as this allows for rapid and accurate delivery of drugs into the systemic circulation and a more exact method of achieving the desired effect from agents delivered. The availability of short, medium, and long-acting opioids, as well as the many routes of administration, give anesthesia providers considerable flexibility in the use of these agents. In this lecture, we will be focusing primarily on intravenous opioids, with a few exceptions along the way that are important for consideration in the PACU. Opioids exhibit large variations in their physiochemical properties, which are what influence their pharmacokinetics, and they therefore differ in their absorption and distribution in the body. In order to reach their effector sites in the central nervous system, opioids must cross biologic membranes from the blood to their receptors on neural cell membranes. An opioid's ability to cross such biologic barriers as the blood-brain barrier and placental barrier to reach effector sites depends on the drug's molecular size, degree of ionization, lipid solubility, and protein binding. A smaller molecular size lends to easier transport across barriers. A drug's degree of ionization affects absorption in that non-ionized forms of drugs are uncharged and thus lipophilic, making them better candidates for absorption across lipid barriers. Ionized molecules or drugs are usually unable to penetrate lipid cell membranes easily because of their low lipid solubility. This results from the electric charges exerted by the ionized drug molecules. The charged drugs are repelled by those sections of the cell membrane with similar charges, preventing their diffusion across the membrane. So, the higher the degree of ionization, the less access the drug has across tissues and barriers. This is an important concept in that ionized drugs then are not absorbed well when taken orally and may not be metabolized by the liver to any significant extent. An opioid's lipid solubility affects absorption across barriers in that those with higher lipophilicity are better absorbed than those that are hydrophilic. Lastly, the percent of protein binding will determine how much of the drug will bind to plasma proteins and with what affinity. Drugs that are bound to proteins in the plasma create a drug protein molecule. This molecule is too large to diffuse through blood vessel membranes and will therefore become trapped within the circulatory system.
protein-bound drugs are not free to act on any receptors, and thus high protein binding prevents the drug from leaving the blood to enter into tissues, resulting in high plasma concentrations. Protein binding and lipid solubility are proportional to one another. The more lipid soluble a drug is, the more highly protein bound it tends to be. Protein binding plays an important role, especially in patients where it has been altered, such as those with reduced proteins, like patients with severe liver or kidney disease, or those with poor nutrition who experience protein deficiencies. These situations where proteins are not as abundant in the body can cause an increase in absorption due to fewer available proteins for binding. Remember, binding drugs with proteins equals inactive drugs. Less proteins equals more active drug in the circulatory system. Thus, patients may require reduced dosing of opioid medications. Opioids in general have a large volume of distribution, which is the volume that the drug disperses into after it is introduced into the system. The same properties discussed in the previous slide, molecular size, lipid solubility, plasma, and protein binding, can determine a relative volume of distribution for opioids. Drugs that are free or unbound to plasma proteins and drugs that are lipid soluble easily cross membranes to tissues. Therefore, they have large volumes of distribution with low plasma concentrations. Fentanyl is an opioid drug that is especially lipophilic and thus has a large volume of distribution. For all of you visual folks, I really think this is a great chart to look over for additional clarification and reinforcement on what we have been talking about in the previous few slides. Here you have a visual representation of the physical characteristics of opioids that determine distribution in the body. You can see that although meperidine and fentanyl both have a low non-ionized fraction, Fentanyl's low protein binding and high lipid solubility make it more easily distributed and give it a larger volume of distribution. Like most drugs, opioids are usually metabolized in the liver to a more polar and less active or inactive compound by both phase 1 and phase 2 processes of biotransformation. Phase 1 reactions include oxidative and reductive reactions, like those drugs catalyzed by cytochrome P450 and hydrolytic reactions. Phase 2 reactions include conjugations. Please refer to your initial lecture on pharmacology basics for additional details regarding these processes. Opioid metabolites are generally inactive, but two drugs will be exceptions to this rule. Both morphine and mepiridine have active metabolites that can prolong the therapeutic effects of their parent compound. These drugs and their metabolites will be discussed in greater detail later in this lecture. Remifentanil will also be an exception to classic metabolism as it is metabolized via ester hydrolysis. Again, this drug and others will be explored in more detail later in this lecture. Interestingly, when a lower dose of an opioid is used, its effects are usually terminated by redistribution rather than by biotransformation metabolism. But this process is easily saturated when large doses or multiple doses are used, thus reverting the opioid to biotransformation for its metabolism. For example, if a one-time low dose of morphine, such as 0.1 mg per kilogram IV, is given, the drug will be metabolized via redistribution. Whereas, if a larger dose of morphine, such as 1 mg per kilogram IV, is given, or if multiple small doses are administered, the redistribution process will become saturated and morphine metabolism will revert to biotransformation. Opioids and their metabolites are excreted primarily by the kidneys and secondarily by the biliary system and gastrointestinal tract. This is a nice way to see a side-by-side -side comparison of the many pharmacokinetic differences between common IV opioids used in the PACU. Here you can see that no one property of an opioid will determine its pharmacokinetics, but that it is a complex combination. The most common method of administering opioids in the pre-, intra-, and post-operative periods is intermittent bolus injection which, although effective, produces wide swings in drug plasma concentration, which gives intermittent periods of deep and light sedation and pain relief. 
Continuous opioid infusion results in plasma concentration that can be maintained more accurately and consistently. Continuous infusion of opioids is associated with hemodynamic stability, reduces the total necessary dose of opioids, and decreases the need for opioid reversal agents. For these reasons, nurses should consider using continuous infusions for patients requiring high doses or multiple doses of opioid medications in the PACU. When choosing opioid infusion medications, it is important to consider the drug's context-sensitive half-time, which is the time required for the drug concentration to decrease by a given percentage after termination of an infusion of a given duration. Taking context-sensitive half-time into consideration when selecting continuous infusions of opioids allows for rational drug selection based on anticipated infusion duration. Here is the graphical representation of contact-sensitive half-time. In this graph, you can see that fentanyl has a much longer contact-sensitive half-time than the other mentioned opioids, alfentanyl, sufentanyl, and remifentanyl. This is due mainly to its high lipophilic status. Now we will move on to the pharmacodynamic effects caused by opioid drugs. We will focus on pharmacodynamics in the central nervous system, cardiovascular system, gastrointestinal and genitourinary systems, as well as some miscellaneous pharmacodynamics along the way. Opioid pharmacodynamics in the central nervous system include euphoria, dysphoria, truncal rigidity, antitussive effects, meiosis, analgesia, and respiratory depression. Euphoria is the feeling of well-being in awake patients. This feeling will vary depending on the agent utilized. Refer to the previous slides in which we discussed different opioid receptors. Those opioids with strong mu receptors, such as fentanyl, will produce a greater euphoric feeling than those with stronger kappa affinity. Ketamine, for example, although not an opioid, has a strong affinity for kappa receptors, and dysphoria is a common side effect with this drug. Dysphoria can also be seen in patients who take opioids in the absence of pain. It is important to remember that euphoria versus dysphoria is a patient-specific interpretation. What might be scary to one patient is playful to another. Truncal rigidity is seen primarily with large IV doses of most opioid agonists, although it is most commonly associated with fentanyl. The problem with truncal rigidity is that it becomes extremely difficult to ventilate patients due to a loss of chest wall compliance as well as a constriction of the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. You may have also heard this called tight chest. Because this effect is most often seen after induction of anesthesia with large doses of opioids at one time, its effects are most often dealt with prior to patient arrival in PACU. But do note there are other patients who may be at risk for this side effect, including those who were on remifentanyl drips, such as craniotomy patients, as well as those who may have received nitrous oxide during their procedure. The antitussive effects of opioids are a result of their depressant effects on the cough center in the medulla. This should not be confused with the protective glottal reflex, which will remain unaffected. All opioids produce this effect, but codeine is an especially good cough suppressant. Because of their ability to suppress patients' cough, opioids may be beneficial for those patients in PACU requiring assistance and tolerating airway devices and ventilators. Meiosis is also known as pinpoint pupils and is caused when opioids depress GABA, causing the oculomotor nerve to constrict the pupil. It is important to note that tolerance to this side effect does not develop. This side effect can be reversed by naloxone, atropine, or glycopyrrolate. Analgesia being the most prominent feature of opioids and respiratory depression one of opioid administration's biggest concerns will be discussed in greater detail in subsequent slides. Providing pain relief is by far opioids' most popular pharmacodynamic property. In this picture, you can note how the brain receives information about pain via the lateral spinothalamic tract. First, the nerve endings of peripheral nociceptors experience a trauma. Information about this trauma then travels via nerve fibers, which have cell bodies located in the dorsal root ganglia of the spinal cord. 
From here, the nerve fibers enter the dorsal horn of gray matter in the spinal cord. Information then travels up the ascending pathway to the brain where information regarding the initial trauma is processed and perceived as pain. Pain control pathways are then activated and descend from the midbrain back to the spinal cord to suppress pain transmission. So, the analgesic effects of opioids come from their ability to directly inhibit the ascending transmission of nociception information from the spinal cord dorsal horn and to activate pain control pathways that descend from the midbrain back to the spinal cord. Respiratory depression is another pharmacodynamic property of opioids. All opiate agonists will produce a dose-dependent depression of respirations via effects on mu and delta receptors in the respiratory centers in the brainstem. The brainstem respiratory centers use hypercarbia and hypoxia as natural stimulants to maintain normal ventilation. Opioids essentially cause the respiratory centers to have a decreased response to hypercarbia and hypoxia. Respiratory rate is going to be affected first, and your classic narcotized patient will take slow, deep breaths. As doses of opiates increase, a subsequent apnea will be produced. So monitoring of respiratory rate in the PACU provides a convenient way of detecting early respiratory depression in patients receiving opioid analgesia. It is our goal in anesthesia to leave some residual analgesia without respiratory depression when patients emerge from anesthesia to address postoperative pain. This can be a true balancing act, especially with subsequent dosing of opioids in the PACU, because the receptors in the brain that control the analgesic effects of opioid drugs also mediate respiratory depression. This graph represents the relationship between opioid administration, PACO2, and alveolar ventilation. Prior to opioid administration, normal ventilation is maintained in a balanced state. This blue line represents normal ventilation prior to opioid administration. You can see that maintenance is balanced between hypoxia and hypercarbia and that 50% of the graph is located above the blue line and 50% below. When an opioid, such as morphine, is delivered, it will increase PACO2 and blunt the response to a CO2 challenge, which results in the shift of the CO2 response curve downward and to the right. Basically, the patient's apneic threshold, or the graded PACO2 at which the patient remains apneic, rises, and hypoxic drive is decreased. Opioids' effects on the cardiovascular system are much less pronounced than many of the other drugs used in the operating room and PACU. Bradycardia is a usual result of opioid administration in healthy patients. However, there is little effect on blood pressure. The bradycardia associated with opioid analgesics results from medullary vagal stimulation and can be treated, when symptomatic, with atropine or glycopyrrolate. All opioids induce some degree of dose-dependent peripheral vasodilation, but myocardial contractility, baroreceptor function, and autonomic responsiveness are not affected. For this reason, opiate anesthesia is often utilized in patients with cardiovascular compromise because of the minimal depression seen. Postural hypotension seen with opioids is noted postoperatively when patients are encouraged to sit upright after having been recumbent for an extended period of time. The postural hypotension can be accentuated by hypovolemic states. The opioid medications, meperidine, morphine, and codeine can be associated with some degree of hypotension associated with histamine release. This effect is absent with fentanyl, sufentanyl, alfentanyl, and remifentanyl. Opioids have multiple effects on the gastrointestinal or GI system and its function. They decrease gastric motility, decrease intestinal propulsive activity, prolong gastric emptying time, and reduce secretory activity, all of which lead to the common problem of opioid-induced constipation and can ultimately lead to the dreaded postoperative ileus. Opioid tendency to increase biliary duct pressure and the tone of the sphincter of OD can precipitate biliary colic, and so their use should be judicious in these patients.
Most texts suggest meperidine and or NSAIDs to be the drug of choice in biliary colic patients as they have the least effect on the biliary duct and sphincter of OD. Like those patients with biliary colic, patients with renal colic may have their treatment compromised by the use of opioid analgesics due to their tendency to increase urinary sphincter tone. Again, meperidine and NSAIDs are thought to be the drug of choice when treating these patients. Opioids usually produce an antidiuretic effect. Those opioids that are agonists at kappa receptors can cause diuresis, decreasing the bladder detrusor muscle tone while continuing to constrict the urinary sphincter. This results in urinary retention. Paritis or itching is a common side effect of opioid analgesia. Along the same line, a rash or feeling of warmth or blush of the face, upper chest, and arms can occur both with histamine and non-histamine releasing drugs. The mechanism responsible for these effects is thought to be through central mu receptors and not through local histamine release. Although this theory is debatable as it is thought that the histamine release seen with morphine, codeine, and meperidine is a non-immunological histamine release from mast cells. Facial itching during morphine administration can be seen as a dysthesia or an interpretation of the pain that the patient is suffering as a facial itch, as a true histamine release is more truncal in nature. Paritis can be treated with antihistamines, but remember that these drugs can be additive to the opioid sedative effects, and thus nursing interventions should be utilized as the first-line treatment. The emetic effects of opioids is a complex and elicited by stimulating the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the area of postrema of the medulla. It is also assumed that there is a vestibular component to the incidence of nausea and vomiting associated with opioid administration as the incidence of nausea and vomiting is much lower pre- and intraoperatively when the patients tend to remain supine. It is interesting to note that by a separate action, higher repeated doses of opioids can actually have an anti-emetic effect by depressing the vomiting center. But clinically speaking, when an opiate is administered as part of a patient's anesthetic plan, there is an increased incidence of postoperative nausea and vomiting. To a lesser extent, opioids can stimulate the release of ADH, prolactin, and somatotropin hormones, and inhibit the release of luteinizing hormone, which over time can lead to a lower testosterone level and cause a reduction of analgesic effect. Now we will begin our discussion of specific drugs that may be given or seen in the PACU. Opioid agonists are by far one of the most highly ordered medications for patients in the postoperative area. They are drugs that bind to opioid receptors and activate them. This can be expressed algebraically as E equals zero. The drugs we will discuss include morphine, codeine, hydromorphone, meperidine, fentanyl, sufentanyl, alfentanyl, remifentanyl, and methadone. Morphine is the prototypical opioid analgesic. It is used for moderate to severe pain and can be administered via the intramuscular, intravenous, subcutaneous, oral, intrathecal, and epidural routes. With morphine administration, sedation will occur prior to analgesia, and thus nurses must not consider morphine-induced sedation as an indication of analgesia. Morphine is one of the least lipophilic of the opioid drugs, meaning it is slow to penetrate biological membranes, such as the blood-brain barrier. It accumulates less in lipid membranes, and it is also slower to provide the onset of pain relief. Morphine does have active metabolites when broken down inside the body. The most important of these metabolites clinically is morphine-6-glucuronidide, or M6G, which can prolong effects and excessive sedation in patients with renal failure. Like most metabolites of drugs, M6G is more hydrophilic than its parent drug, morphine, making it harder to cross the blood-brain barrier into the central nervous system. But in patients who cannot readily excrete the metabolite, like those in renal failure, high concentrations of the metabolite will build in the bloodstream, and at high levels, M6G can enter the central nervous system, where it is more potent than morphine. Morphine is also associated with the release of histamine from mast cells.
This histamine release can cause itching and redness at the injection site or even red streaking along the IV route. Patients may exhibit a generalized overall flushing as well. Although considered cardiac stable because it has no direct effect on blood pressure, heart rate, or heart rhythm, the histamine release from higher doses of morphine can be associated with a decrease in systemic vascular resistance, hypotension, and tachycardia. Codeine is a prodrug of morphine, meaning that it is an inactive drug that must be metabolized to an active drug and is one-tenth the potency of morphine. When administered orally, 5 to 10% of the codeine drug is actually converted into the active drug morphine via the CYP2D6 enzyme. Interestingly, 10% of the population lacks this enzyme and thus gets no pain relief from codeine. For these patients, Tylenol with codeine is just plain Tylenol. Codeine is known to produce great antitussive effects and in combination with acetaminophen for pain relief is often of great benefit in transition from the PACU setting to a lower level of care. Hydromorphone or Dilaudid is a semi-synthetic opioid, meaning that it was derived from morphine. Although its pharmacokinetic profile is similar to morphine, it is 5 to 10 times more potent. Despite its higher potency, its duration of action tends to be shorter relative to morphine, and unlike our morphine prototype, hydromorphone has no active metabolites, and so it is recommended over morphine for patients with renal failure. Meperidine, also known as Demerol, has been a very common drug used postoperatively for many years. It is one-eighth the potency of morphine, making it a good choice for moderate pain relief. It is completely synthetic and structurally it resembles atropine, which allows for less biliary spasm and constipation than with morphine. Also, meperidine's atropine-like structure means that the common pinpoint pupils seen in opioid use will not be present, so don't let this fool you when observing patients for opioid overdose. One of the major downfalls to meperidine's use is that it is biotransformed to an active metabolite named normaperidine. When accumulation of this metabolite occurs, as in patients with renal failure and those requiring higher doses, such as cancer patients, CNS excitation and a lower seizure threshold are significant risks. Meperidine can also be used for the non-analgesic purpose of postoperative shivering. It is thought that the drug's ability to reduce shivering stems from its activation of kappa receptors. Its ability to decrease shivering not only provides comfort to patients, but also decreases the accompanying increase in oxygen consumption associated with shivering. Meperidine also exhibits significant drug-drug interactions with MAO inhibitors, which can lead to hyperthermia, seizures, and even death via serotonin syndrome. Please refer to your first lesson with Michael Storm regarding additional details on this topic. Fentanyl is the most widely used opioid analgesic in anesthesia and is 80 to 100 times more potent than morphine. One of its greatest benefits is that its analgesic, respiratory depressant, and sedative effects are dose-dependent and thus more predictable. Fentanyl is also highly lipid-soluble, which makes for rapid tissue uptake in the body. For this reason, a single dose of fentanyl is terminated via redistribution, while multiple doses and or continuous infusions of fentanyl are eliminated, not redistributed. Remember our discussion regarding contact-sensitive half-life? Well, fentanyl has the highest contact-sensitive half-life because of its extremely lipophilic nature. There should be special consideration given to dosing fentanyl in the elderly and neonate, as these populations exhibit prolonged elimination of fentanyl. Fentanyl can also be administered via multiple routes, including patches. This is an important concept to remember when taking care of patients postoperatively. When doing thorough skin assessments, look for patches, which can often be overlooked, and remember to pass along and report the administration of fentanyl patches, as subsequent dosing can lead to opioid-induced respiratory depression. Sufentanil is a synthetic opioid derived from fentanyl and is 7 to 10 times more potent than fentanyl. Used most often in surgical situations where profound analgesia is required, such as cardiac surgery or in neurospine surgeries as part of a balanced anesthesia technique. 
analgesia with sufentanil can be induced more rapidly with basically the same technique as that used for fentanyl without an increase in the incidence rate of chest wall rigidity, which makes it a great choice in cardiac surgeries requiring sternal incision. In most hospital settings, its use is confined to the intraoperative period due to its high potency and risk for respiratory depression without supportive measures. Alfentanil is another analog of fentanyl with one-tenth the potency. Although alfentanil has never gained popularity intraoperatively, it seems as though many of alfentanil properties may make it a great choice for the relief of immediate severe pain in the PACU setting. Despite being less lipid soluble than fentanyl, alfentanil has a high non-ionized fraction at physiologic pH and a small volume of distribution, which account for its more rapid onset and shorter duration of action than fentanyl. Also, alfentanil has no active metabolites. Besides making alfentanil an extremely predictable drug, this also increases its therapeutic index. A therapeutic index is the ratio of the lethal dose to the effective dose. The higher the therapeutic index, the farther the lethal dose is from the dose used for the desired effect. The therapeutic index of alfentanil is approximately 2.5 times more favorable than that of fentanyl. Like most opioid analgesics, alfentanil shows minimal hemodynamic changes when administered to patients, which prevents dangerous swings in blood pressure and heart rate postoperatively. All of these properties may make alfentanil advantageous in choosing opioids for patients in the PACU. Remifentanil is a short-acting opioid with a potency almost equal to that of fentanyl. It is moderately lipophilic with an ester linkage, and it is metabolized by hydrolysis catalyzed by general esterase enzymes to a less active compound and is not dependent on cholinesterase enzymes for metabolism. Thus, it is not influenced by changes in cholinesterase. This means that the administration of succinylcholine and its subsequent metabolism do not influence remifentanil breakdown. Besides its rapid metabolism, remifentanil also has a low volume of distribution and a large clearance with no cumulative effects, which result in a short half-life for the drug of approximately 10 minutes. For this reason, remifentanil is easily titratable and it makes sense that it is only useful in continuous intravenous fashion and is very popular in TIVA or total intravenous anesthetic techniques especially when assessing neurological status postoperatively is important. Again, because of its rapid metabolism, remifentanil is better than most intravenous opioids with regard to residual effects, and thus there is less postoperative respiratory depression. Also because of its rapid metabolism, additional medications for pain relief will be required in the postoperative period, and PACU nurses should work with anesthesia providers to be sure that a plan of care to relieve postoperative pain is in place prior to completing the handoff of a patient who has received remifentanil intraoperatively. As opioid addiction grows, more and more patients will be seen in the operative setting on methadone, which is an opioid agonist that when administered orally is four times more potent than morphine without any active metabolites. It is important to understand that patients on methadone preoperatively will continue this medication and additional administration of opioids can have additive effects. This is not to say that these patients should not receive adequate medication to treat their individual pain needs, but it should be considered when determining which medication should be administered, dosing of additional opioids, and when considering signs of overdose. Opioid administration, although extremely useful for analgesia pre-, intra-, and post-operatively, is not without risk. In the intraoperative period, a protected airway and mechanical ventilation can afford anesthesia providers the ability to deliver higher dose opioids to patients while undergoing surgery. Great measures are taken to assure patients are able to protect their airway with little to no respiratory support prior to transport to PACU. Yet delayed opioid effects, additive medications, and other factors may cause unforeseen problems for the PACU nurse in the form of opioid overdose. PACU nurses play a critical role in preventing opioid overdoses and in quickly recognizing and treating them. The major signs and symptoms of opioid overdose include a stuporous state or coma, 
hypoventilation, and meiosis. In addition to routine PACU monitoring, patients receiving opioids in the PACU setting should have their respiratory status monitored for rate and trend. For example, if a patient's respiratory rate decreases from 18 to 10 in a 45-minute interval, the nurse should have strong suspicion that excessive opioid effect has occurred. Clinicians should recognize that an overdose from meperidine will not produce the classic overdose sign of meiosis. This is because it is structurally similar to atropine. Also, remember that meiosis can be masked by atropine or glycopyrrolate administration, which are standard drugs given to reverse muscle relaxation prior to extubation in the operating room. Skeletal muscles may also become flaccid, and airway obstruction is a strong possibility. A low body temperature is considered a late sign of opioid overdose and is not considered diagnostic. If an opioid overdose is suspected, immediate attention should be paid to respiratory support. Nurses must monitor patients closely and be quick to initiate nursing interventions that encourage respiration and ventilation. Prophylactic supplemental oxygen should not be delayed and nurses should place patients on nasal cannula or simple face mask while assessing the need for airway support with oral or nasal airway devices and or the need for assisted ventilation with bag mask technique. Assistance from appropriate higher level providers should not be delayed and invasive airway management performed by skilled providers via intubation should be anticipated, especially in the presence of excessive secretions or vomitus. In addition to respiratory support, the treatment for an opioid overdose should include the consideration of administration of naloxone, an opioid antagonist that will be discussed in greater detail in subsequent slides. Now we will continue with opioid antagonists. Opioid antagonists are drugs that have a competitive affinity for opioid receptors, but no efficacy at those receptors. This can be represented algebraically as E equals zero. The two specific opioid antagonists in this lecture will be naloxone and methylnatrexone. Naloxone is an intravenous drug given for opioid overdose. It is a non-selective competitive antagonist at all opioid receptors. The non-selectivity of naloxone means that it will reverse not only the respiratory depressant effects of opioids, but also their analgesic effects. So one can assume that after administration of naloxone, patients will be in pain. Please remember that subsequent administration of opioid medication must be done with extreme caution, if at all. This is where the competitive portion of the drug comes into play. Because naloxone is a competitive antagonist, providers delivering opioid analgesics after naloxone administration will have to give higher doses of the opioid in order to compete off the naloxone drug from the receptor and achieve the desired effects. The reason this is so dangerous is because the half-life of naloxone is much shorter, being 30 to 45 minutes, than most opioid analgesics. This means that when the naloxone is no longer active and attached to the receptor, there can be toxic levels of opioids still existing in the body. This is an important concept to be aware of anytime naloxone is administered, not just with subsequent analgesic administration. Because naloxone can wear off before the opioid that has caused the overdose has been fully eliminated, it can lead to relapse of respiratory depressive effects requiring a redose of naloxone. When being administered in a controlled environment and under the supervision of advanced practitioners, such as in the PACU, treatment with naloxone should start with lower doses such as 40 mics and can then be titrated to effect. This may prevent adverse cardiovascular effects that can occur when an opioid is completely reversed with higher dose naloxone, such as 400 mics. Traditional administration is in 40 microgram increments every 2-3 to three minutes until the return of adequate respirations and ventilation. Since naloxone is most commonly supplied in a vial of 0.4 mg in 1 ml, which is 400 micrograms in 1 ml, nurses may wish to make incremental dosing easier by aspirating the 1 ml from the vial of naloxone and adding it to 9 ml of crystalloid in a 10 ml syringe.
Done this way, the new concentration is 40 micrograms per ml. Care must be taken when giving naloxone as rapid administration can cause severe pulmonary edema, hypertension, arrhythmias, and as previously mentioned, pain. Methyl naltrexone is not a drug that is given in the operating room or the PACU, but it is important to mention in this lecture series as its popularity has increased for patients on chronic opioid medications. It is used to treat the chronic constipation that can be caused from chronic opioid use. Its minimal systemic absorption means that its effects are only produced at its site of action, which is the gastrointestinal or GI tract. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it cannot block the pain relief pathways in the brain or spinal cord of opioid medications such as morphine. Side effects of methyl naltrexone include abdominal pain, flatulence, and diarrhea. Partial opioid agonists have an affinity for opioid receptors, but a low efficacy. This can be represented algebraically as E equals 0 minus 1. Tramadol is representative of this group. Tramadol is a synthetic codeine analog and is a weak mu opioid receptor agonist effective in the treatment of mild to moderate pain. It is a racemic mixture, meaning it is a 50-50 mixture of two enantiomers or molecules that are mirror images of each other. In racemic mixtures, the two enantiomers have very different properties. This is the case with tramadol, as its positive enantiomer is the only one that binds to the mu opioid receptor. The positive enantiomer also inhibits serotonin uptake, which aids in the drug's analgesic effects. Tramadol's negative enantiomer inhibits norepinephrine uptake and stimulates alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Because only one of tramadol's enantiomers binds to an opioid receptor in a weak fashion, it is considered a partial opioid agonist. This property also means that tramadol will retain some of its analgesic effects after the administration of naloxone. Although its respiratory depressant effects, which are caused by the mu opioid receptor activation, can be reversed by naloxone. Serotonin syndrome occurs when there is far too much serotonin in the body and no way to break it down. It can occur with several drug combinations, but of particular interest in this lecture is its occurrence with the use of tramadol. Tramadol, as previously discussed, inhibits serotonin uptake as part of its mechanism of analgesia. When combined with other drugs that increase serotonin or prevent its breakdown, such as monoamine oxidase inhibitors, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, homeopathic drugs like St. John's wort, ginseng, and nutmeg, and or over-the-counter cough and cold medications containing dextromethorphan, like Desilem and Mucinex DM. The level of serotonin in the body can reach toxic levels, leading to serotonin syndrome. Please note this is not an inclusive list of drug interactions that can lead to serotonin syndrome. It is important for PACU nurses to recognize home medications taken by their patients to prevent concurrent administration of tramadol to patients at risk for serotonin syndrome. Signs and symptoms of serotonin syndrome include high temperature, diaphoresis, myoclonus, hyperreflexia, autonomic instability of blood pressure and heart rate, and coma. These symptoms can resemble malignant hyperthermia, a severe and potentially deadly reaction from anesthetics. PACI nurses are vital in helping with differential diagnosis as malignant hyperthermia can be treated when caught quickly with a medication called dantrolene, whereas serotonin syndrome has no cure and treatment is according to symptoms. The mixed agonist-antagonist drugs represent a category of drugs that produce a primary opioid effect using the competitive antagonist properties on the mu opioid receptor and the agonist properties at the kappa receptor. This allows them their analgesic properties. Their benefit is in their low addiction potential and ability to provide mild and moderate pain relief. Three opioid agonist antagonists will be presented in this presentation, pentazosin, butorphanol, and buprenorphine. Pentazosin, commonly known as Tolin, is an opioid agonist antagonist, which is one-third the potency of morphine with kappa and delta agonist and weak mu antagonist properties. 
It is combined with naloxone in the oral form of Toluene NX, which is an important factor in reducing the risk of addiction to pentazosin and aids in its safety profile. Because of naloxone's huge first pass effect, it is virtually ineffective orally. So when pentazosin is taken as prescribed, which is orally, the naloxone has no effect on receptors. But if the drug is injected intravenously, naloxone will cross the blood-brain barrier and essentially steal receptors, preventing analgesia and the high associated with intravenous opioid administration. Pentazosin, like all opioids, has the potential for respiratory depression, which can be potentiated by general anesthetics. Hallucinations and confusion with pentazosin administration are thought to be due to its kappa receptor activation. Abrupt withdrawal can be precipitated by pentazosin if administered to a patient dependent on opioids. Butorphanol is five times more potent than morphine and is a kappa agonist and weak mu antagonist. It is traditionally given orally or via nasal spray. Overdose on butorphanol produces respiratory depression, but interestingly, this side effect has somewhat of a ceiling effect, which aids to an increased safety profile for the drug. The plateau of the respiratory depression seen with butorphanol can be explained in that 2 mg of butorphanol depresses the respiratory system equal to that of 10 mg of morphine. But the magnitude of respiratory depression seen with butorphanol is not significantly increased at a dose of 4 mg, whereas the magnitude of respiratory depression seen with morphine is significantly increased at a dose of 20 mg. As with pentazosin, any respiratory depression produced by butorphanol can be reversed with naloxone. Butorphanol is not normally given intravenously because unlike most opioids, its effects on the cardiovascular system are significant. In IV form, butorphanol can increase pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary wedge pressure, left ventricular and diastolic pressure, systemic arterial pressure, and pulmonary vascular resistance. Like all other drugs with opioid antagonist properties, butorphanol can induce withdrawal in patients addicted to opioids. Buprenorphine is an agonist antagonist used for mild to moderate pain relief. It is also often used to reduce cravings in people who are trying to recover from addiction to heroin. It is less easily reversed than some other drugs by naloxone because of its high affinity for the mu receptor, which makes it harder to push off the receptor and allows it to dissociate slowly. Dependence on a drug occurs when the drug is necessary for normal physiological functioning, as demonstrated by withdrawal reaction or abstinence syndrome upon discontinuation. Withdrawal reactions can usually be said to be the opposite of the physiological effects produced by the drug. As you can see, many of the signs and symptoms of opioid withdrawal are also common side effects seen after anesthesia and treated in the PACU, such as nausea and vomiting and increased blood pressure. It is important for the PACU nurse to be able to determine when or if a patient is going through an opioid withdrawal in order to provide safe, effective treatment and to prevent withdrawal during the post-surgical time in which the symptoms of withdrawal could be of greater detriment to the patient. As discussed in previous slides, some medications such as naloxone and any of the mixed opioid agonist antagonist drugs can precipitate an acute withdrawal syndrome in patients who are opioid dependent. Remember, opioid dependency does not always present in commercial form, and patients with chronic pain, such as those who have received back surgery, may be on long-term opioid medications. Here are some of the most common opioid agents used in the PACU, their route and suggested dosage ranges. I want to emphasize that these are just suggested dose ranges and reiterate that higher and lower doses may be indicated for specific patient needs. This chart will be available to you all in your handout for individual referencing. When considering what pain medication is appropriate for your patient and or what dosage, it can be helpful to think in a step-like fashion. The idea is to increase the potency of the pain medication and dosage in relevance to an increase in pain level and persistence. A good rule of thumb we use in anesthesia when deciding on pain medication is that you can always add more, but you can't take it back. This helps us to treat pain without compromising safety. Opioids are one of the most commonly prescribed postoperative medications.
For this reason, an excellent working knowledge of the pharmacology of opioids is critical information for the perianesthetic nurse when caring for post-surgical patients. Opioids possess excellent qualities of pain relief, but incorrect administration or the absence of appropriate monitoring can lead to dire outcomes. The advent of newer opioids and complex opioid agonist antagonists will require the PACU and anesthesia team to work cohesively to prevent adverse outcomes. Thank you all for your attention to this lecture, and I hope that you have learned some valuable information that you can incorporate into your own practice. We hope you have enjoyed this fourth lecture in the series. We have created a seven lecture series covering many techniques used in anesthesia. We are specifically focused on the need of the PAC URN and hope you will find some time to view the other six lectures as well. The lecture series include this lecture, Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, and the following six lectures, Basic Principles of Pharmacology, Inhalation Anesthesia, Non-Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, Neuromuscular Blocking Agents, Local Anesthetics, and Regional Anesthesia. All lectures are available on the Palmetto Health Internet as well as on stormanesthesia.com forward slash education forward slash PACU forward slash PACU videos.